Hey there, and welcome to the Overcomers Overcoming Podcast. It is great to have you join us. This podcast series features those who have gained victory over a life encounter. With that life experience, we encourage those who are experiencing something that might seem to be insurmountable. We advance and encourage others by passing forward evaluated life experiences. We have three objectives in this podcast series. We want to encourage those who are engaged in any type of life encounter by offering to walk with you to help you gain victory over anything that might seem impossible. We want to share our experience to help you. Our second objective is to help you develop a confident resolve that there are multiple options to get past any life obstacle. It's a matter of thinking into the situation. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you are facing a dilemma resulting from a previous decision you wish you could reverse, we want to help you think into all of the facts and factors involved in making an informed decision. I'm Ron Cooper, founder of The Cooper Culture. I'm with my wife and business manager, Marty. Together, we are The Cooper Culture Company, who is sponsoring this podcast series. Today, we feature Chelsea Brooke Cole, She describes her early life as being raised in a narcissistic type family, very nurturing relationship with her mother and less so with her father. That carried into her feelings of being in a narcissistic relationship. And she is in a process of recovering from that as she describes it's a lifelong journey, but she's carrying forward her experience of being in a narcissistic relationship as a psychotherapist is helping others avoid those type relationships. Marty, what are some takeaways our listeners can gain from Chelsea? I was surprised she would go into the therapy of what she went through in her life, but she said at an early age that's that's what she thought she always wanted to do, which she is doing. She helps people that are going through that with someone that is a narcissist and explains narcissistic abuse and relational trauma and helps them recognize the thinking of a narcissist, communication, their controlling actions, And then she explains how to set boundaries with these people that are going through that. I think it's an amazing story of taking your life and making it part of your helping other people. Marty, it's a type testimony that is very meaningful to some because I know there's some who are in a narcissistic relationship and they are just accepting that. So let's listen and learn together how we can benefit from Chelsea. Chelsea, thank you so much for joining us. Our listeners are going to be very interested in your background, how you've overcome, because there are a lot of us, and I'm including myself, in describing what I think was a part of your background of what Chelsea used to be. And with your permission and indulgence, I want to describe that just very briefly. But Chelsea, it's good to have you with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. From what I read in your profile, you at an earlier age were a little uncertain of who you are. You were uncertain what strengths you had, if any. You weren't certain what value you had. And because of that, you might have allowed some people to manipulate you, control you, and so forth, because you were just uncertain who you are. That's what you were at an earlier age. You have overcome that, and you're passing forward to our listeners and many others just how you can overcome what may be described as an inadequate, unsure background that may have been set up or caused by what I call some meaningful but yet hurtful words. How accurate, or correct me if any of that is not descriptive of what you used to be? I think partly for sure. It's interesting because growing up, I had this dichotomy where I had a really secure attachment with my mom, who's super compassionate. She's like an empath, and we were very close. And then on the other side, my dad, I would have described as quite emotionally neglectful and cold and absent. He had one presentation to the public and to friends. And then at home, 
would be very disengaged. And if things weren't going on that he was interested in, then he just wasn't present, really didn't develop much of a relationship with me. And I saw, I felt the tension at home. So part of me knew who I was. Like I knew from an early age, I wanted to be a therapist and I wanted to help people. Like I was one of those weird kids who knew at eight years old that they wanted to be a therapist and, and read self-help books, like in my spare time. And then on the other side, I, I think the impact that that dad had on me was I didn't know how to develop or feel familiar with healthy relationships, especially romantic relationships, that the foundation to feel familiar with these very hot and cold relationships. That is very descriptive. And thank you for that. I'm going to make a statement with no intention of blaming, but it is just assessing the way things used to be so that we can pass forward some of our evaluated life experiences. You describe yourself as having a very healthy relationship with your mom, less than healthy relationship with your dad. And you may have been a little bit confused as to how you wanted that relationship and it wasn't there, it seems. And again, I want to make certain our listeners know, and you know, I'm not trying to blame anybody, but we're just trying to assess mm -hmm. what maybe caused things to happen. I'm very much a cause and effect kind of person. But as you grew older, you were able to assess the why and move forward and get beyond. Is that an accurate statement? It did. It was a journey for sure. But I was able to make sense of what I had went through. And once I was able to make sense of it and identify some of the patterns and what was happening and identify how that was continuing in my relationships, then I was able to find a way to move forward. Would it be fair to say, and again, in hindsight, as you assess, you wanted a relationship with your dad that you did not have at an early age, and maybe because of that, you allowed some people to control or manipulate you, and I don't want to try to suppose, but I'm just trying to read into some of your savings. Mm-hmm. Well, I think any child wants a relationship with their parent. I mean, I think we have that, you know, just biological need to attach. I remember wanting that for sure. And the sad thing is a lot of kids, I think, in those situations blame themselves. They internalize it and because they don't understand why a parent is absent or why there's this tension in the home. So I think for a long time, I carried that with me, some kind of like there's something wrong with me because I don't have this relationship with a parent. And then growing up, in relationships, it familiarized me with, like I said, the kind of trauma bonded, hot and cold relationships. That's what felt familiar. And initially what feels familiar feels safe. So it took some time and some healing to heal my own attachment wounds and the, the insecurities and the things that I had developed from childhood in order to, to really feel comfortable with healthier relationships. How old were you? And just kind of how long did it take to overcome the hurts of the past, to become more confident in yourself, to be able to, I guess I would phrase it, have enough confidence that you can really move forward and not allow others to manipulate or control what you think? I think that's an ongoing process. And I think that's something that's actually really important for people to understand about healing is it's not a destination. It's not something that you get there and you're like, okay, I don't have triggers anymore and nothing gets to me and I don't have anxieties and I don't ruminate anymore. I mean, I'm a therapist who specializes in this. I've had my own relationships with narcissistic individuals and I continue to help people um, heal from narcissistic relationships. And that's one of the things that I think is really important to help people normalize in the healing journey is that it's a process. Do you make progress? Sure. Are you always where you want to be? No, but it's really important to see how far you've come. You mentioned triggers, and Marty and I do mention trigger points. I think what I'm hearing you say is you never told you, you can't expunge what happened in the past. Various triggers can trigger those thoughts. So is it a matter of just managing how you think about those trigger points and be able to move beyond them as opposed to allowing those trigger points to hold you captive? 
I think the big difference is we have to have a mindset shift on what a trigger is. A lot of survivors feel that triggers are a sign of weakness. It means I haven't healed. It means I haven't made progress. I'm still stuck. I'm still bound to this. And I encourage people to look at it like triggers validate your reality. They show that what you went through was real because you wouldn't have triggers if you didn't go through something. So it's not that you're bad, but it is that you went through something bad or significant. And so recognizing that those triggers validate your reality and not judging them when they come up. I feel like that's what a lot of clients and I have, have experienced myself is, is there's this judgment and expectation around, well, I shouldn't still struggle with this, or I shouldn't still have this trigger or have this emotional reaction because logically I'm not in childhood anymore. I'm an adult, so I shouldn't have these fears or insecurities. And so recognizing that bring compassion to your triggers and to those hurt parts of you instead of judging them. I think what I'm hearing you say as well is there is a mindset transformation and that transformation is a lifelong journey. It's never a goal, but rather it's a journey you're working toward. Is that an overstatement? I think that's hundred percent accurate. Like I said, the biggest thing for people to to continue on their healing journey is to make sure you're looking at your progress, make sure you're looking at, you know, you are a different person today than you were six months ago, a year ago. So many survivors are looking in the future and they see where they want to be. And so they really overlook or dismiss how much that they have already overcome. So what are, and well, I was about to ask you, what are some of the things, but I, I'll, I'll let our listeners know and I'm going to note this on the narrative of this podcast, your website, but you have a narcissistic test there. And mm -hmm. I went through that this morning. Very interesting to have a person go through that. And do you want to describe what that narcissistic test is, at least in uh, just kind of some general terms? Sure. I have a few quizzes on my website just to help people make some sense or start making some clarity about what they're going through. So I have some quizzes tests on if you're being gaslighted, if you're being narcissistically abused, if your parent or partner is a narcissist. And that's really just to help people start to make sense of things, because that's where we often start in these kind of toxic relationships is they just don't make any sense. And we're searching for answers and we're searching for understanding. So those quizzes help people get some clarity initially on what they might be dealing with. Is a part of that clarity knowing if you are engaged in a narcissistic relationship, meaning a narcissistic relationship is a toxic relationship mm -hmm. and the narcissist, what, wants to control you? Is that a part of what a narcissist does? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Because when you're dealing with a narcissist, you have to really understand their inner workings because they don't think like a healthy person, their intention, they're very transactional in relationships. They often use people as pawns to get what they want. They'll lie to you, charm you, manipulate you, all depends on what they need from you at the time. Now, a lot of, you know, healthy, self-reflective people are looking to genuinely make connections and build authentic relationships and share and all those healthy communication strategies we hear about. Unfortunately, none of those work with toxic people. So does a person who is narcissistic almost look for those and they can easily spot those who are vulnerable? And it's just a, and it maybe in hindsight, Chelsea, did you know that you were vulnerable or just recollect that, yes, I was vulnerable and susceptible to those kinds of things? Well, narcissists are interpersonally exploitative, meaning they are looking for people who are easier to control. An empty vessel, someone who they kind of break down over time, is easier to steer, is easier to manipulate and control. So a lot of narcissists absolutely look for people who have what they lack. So people who are really kind and empathetic and generous and giving. Because if you consider yourself to be a really kind, empathetic, forgiving person, then you you're okay you want to believe that people can change and you see their potential and narcissists unfortunately instead of take that as the gift that it is they exploit it and use it against you for the person who might be identifying with everything you're saying well maybe i am in a toxic narcissistic relationship 
-hmm. Is it a matter of breaking it off or do you, is it your experience you can change the narcissist or is this a matter of you need to assess where you are, maybe make a really difficult decision to break it off and start over? Mm -hmm. Well, we want to know upfront, we can't change not only a narcissist, but I would argue anyone really that has to come from, you know, your own willingness and desire to change. So if you're listening and you're finding that actually, I think I might be with a very entitled grandiose manipulative person, you know, people find themselves in different situations. Sometimes a narcissistic person is a parent or a family member or a long-term friend or a boss or a colleague or a partner. Sometimes it's not really feasible or practical to just cut these relationships off. If you are able to go no contact, meaning you're able to get out of that relationship and not have to talk with that person, research suggests that's the best strategy that has the the most helpful effects, but that's just not, again, realistic for a lot of people. So then it goes to boundaries and not just physical boundaries, like how much time you spend with them, but really those mental and emotional boundaries, because that's where narcissists push you the most. For the listener who may be in this kind of relationship that, gosh, I need to reassess everything and maybe just break off. Can you help that person start out and it really what i'm asking is I'm, I'm really getting to elementary terms as you're looking for a prospective long-term mate do you suggest that person look at values attributes and character traits those kinds of things can you identify early on what some of those are and mm -hmm. is is that a way to get started in a new relationship to hopefully not go down the same track that I mm -hmm. just went through type thing. Mm -hmm. You definitely want to be looking for red flags early if you're able to do that. Some of the things we can be looking for because narcissists are quite grandiose and they tend to be very superficial. They focus a lot on what things look like and being charming and charismatic. Their relationships tend to be quite superficial. Like I said, they look for people they can manipulate or charm. They have this kind of grandiose sense of self. Like oh, I'll briefly describe grandiose narcissists is what most people think of when they hear the term narcissist. They come across as quite charming, but also arrogant and entitled. Sometimes that kind of narcissist is honestly a little bit easier to spot because you you might kind of feel drawn in sometimes because they can be very charismatic. However, if you have a more sensitive temperament, you almost might feel like a grandiose narcissist is too much. Like you're almost kind of pushed back by their, their intensity, their grandiosity. The ones that I find do a lot of damage is what's called the vulnerable narcissist because they actually draw you in by getting you to feel sorry for them. You kind of feel like you're in quicksand when you're talking to them they gain narcissistic supply or that validation, attention, admiration for their grandiose sense of self by getting your sympathy and your pity and your attention. But they feel entitled to your time, your help, your resources, your money, and they will guilt you if you try to set boundaries and walk away. As you reflect on the Chelsea that used to be, how old were you when you made the change and what i'm referring to chelsea is you i think started to develop a healthy attitude about yourself a healthy confidence i'll call it you realize that you are manipulatable but then you said nope this is this is going to change and you do a your self-described work in progress as all of us are how old would you say you were if you can reflect on that to make that change that you're going to do things different it's almost hard to, to pinpoint a time. So I started college when I was 16. I kind of had this mindset of I need to be independent, self-sufficient quite quickly. So that led me to starting college at 16. I graduated with my master's at 22, started working full-time as a therapist, and I've been doing that ever since. So it's really been a process. I mean, I was exposed to talking about psychology and narcissism and that stuff in undergrad, in grad school, obviously going through counseling, uh, that, that whole counseling program when you're going through your master's is almost a, a big group counseling session anyways. You do a lot of personal work there too. So I definitely had a lot of growth during that period of making sense of things, understanding things, healing those attachment wounds. And I would say in the last couple of years, even I've seen more 
growth. I have some really healthy relationships now, and I can't say enough for how healing those are to have those corrective emotional experiences where the trigger says someone's going to be mad at you. And you kind of have that really tense, anxious, hypervigilant feeling come up. And then if you have a healthy person in your life who doesn't respond that way, who responds with care and compassion and understanding, those emotional experiences are so healing. So I would say even up to the last couple of years, I've really seen even more growth in that. And as a work in progress, it would be fair to say you are almost always managing, if that's an appropriate term, having to consciously deal with those trigger points and stay away from any of those things that used to be the Chelsea of the past? You know, I don't know that I I almost see um, the human experience as one fluid kind of consciousness where it's not like you are your, your, just your child self, and then you pop into adulthood our body really holds those memories. It holds everything that you've been through. So are there moments when I think, ah, oh, I'm good in my you know, adult self that I've worked on and the healthy parts of me that I've developed more. And then there are periods where I can identify, ooh, that's kind of that child part coming up or people pleaser part coming up. And so it's just one of those really you know, fluid experiences. We're all we're all kind of mixed with things that are healthy and then parts of us that that we keep working on. I appreciate the fact you said it's okay for the trigger points Mm -hmm. because that helps you realize you're in that moment, but you're getting through that moment. So it's okay because I think we punish ourselves when we think back, oh, this is what hurt me and I don't want this again. And what do I do Mm -hmm. about it? A listener could just say, it's okay. I'm okay Mm -hmm. going through this and I will get through it because they want to. Do you sometimes deal with trigger points or flashbacks or possibly are they very frequent? The other thing I would ask you, do those flashbacks or trigger points frequently dominate your current thought process dominate in a negative way, cause you to think less of yourself, cause you to doubt your worth, maybe create anxieties in you that cause you to think irrationally. Trigger points in thoughts of the past are very common. We never totally expunge or erase things of the past. It is a matter of dealing with them. I want to encourage you, seek help, professional help, the help of a coach to help you beyond those things of the past that tend to dominate your current thought, tend to influence your current thinking and cause you to possibly have negative thoughts or those thoughts that are not edifying to you and possibly others. Let's work together. Right. If anything, the most healing happens in the way you start interacting differently with yourself. When you have those moments that come up, because sometimes even as an adult, we can kind of be triggered to feel like a kid again. And that's always a sign to me that that's like an earlier, not necessarily unhealed, but raw, perhaps vulnerable part of you that's coming up. And so it's a difference of saying, why am I still dealing with this? I should be over this by now to, you know what, I went through something and I'm having a moment right now and it's okay for me to take some time out or to call a friend or ask for help or just be gentle with myself. Right. Forgive yourself for whatever. I mean, however you reacted to that moment way back when, you don't have to react that way now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, as we come into adulthood, we are able to see things from a different perspective. When you're a kid, you don't know why what's happening in your environment. You don't necessarily even know that another way exists. You're just in your home life, living it, surviving it. So when you get to adulthood, I think the thing that we have now is perspective. We can look back and go, oh, like how my parents raised me maybe wasn't best for me, or maybe they were doing what they could, but it still had this impact on me. And I have to acknowledge that now and bring compassion to myself. Talk to the listener who is in a very toxic relationship, and I'm going to be a bit stereotypical, perhaps, 
in saying that it may be the male who is more dominating than the female. The male is just because of his stature and whatever else is a very controlling, dominating, manipulative kind of person and wants to keep you in this toxic relationship that he has total control of you. You know it's toxic. You know you want to break it up. But he has such a control over you. In fact, you're concerned there may be retribution from breaking up from him and these kind of things. And you just feel totally trapped. How do you work with a lady who feels that way? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of my clients are in that exact position. Of course, both males and females can be abusive, but statistics show that it, males are more likely to be narcissistic. And in that example, you're describing really the word that comes up is coercive control, you know, that where they've instilled this fear or, or domination, where you almost feel like you don't have choices at this point. And so part of the way that I would initially work with a person like that is to help them get their voice back, setting si what I call silent boundaries. And that's essentially where you start allowing yourself to think your own thoughts and feel your own feelings. Because if you're in a relationship like that, it's very likely a lot of gaslighting is happening where they have broken you down, broken down your sense of self-trust, your sense of being able to understand what's going on or, or correctly interpreting reality. So those silent boundaries are the things you do that no one else even necessarily knows you're doing, but you start giving yourself back to yourself, your thoughts, your feelings. And so let's say, that very narcissistic partner is talking to you and telling you um, how you should feel or what you should think or how things are going to be. And you just allow yourself to start thinking, I don't agree with that. I don't think that this is how I feel. This is actually what happened. Writing things down can be a really good way to help start validating your reality. Because again, gaslighting makes you question everything, your memory, your competence. So if you're able to write things down, things that have happened in the relationship and be able to look back on that and go, oh yeah, we did talk about that. And they said, I never told them that, but actually I did. Or here's the conversation we happened and here are the facts that can really help you start to validate your reality and come back to your sense of self. Is it therapeutic to have a friend and maybe confidence as being a part of this boundaries and mm -hmm. confidence are work hand in hand. That is, I have to know my boundaries, but I have to be confident enough that I can enforce those boundaries. And sometimes I'm thinking it may be beneficial to talk with a person who empathizes with you and you can talk some things into existence. Now I'm referring to confidence that as I verbalize my boundaries and I speak with a person that I, I feel very safe in sharing I can develop a confidence to confront, if that's an appropriate term, mm -hmm. my the narcissistic person. The more I talk with and exercise my confidence, the greater the confidence I have in being firmer on those boundaries. Is that mm -hmm. a viable approach? Mm -hmm. I think those reaching out for those healthy relationships are super important because it's often in telling other people that you realize what you're going through. Because when you can tell a friend, hey, this happened between me and my partner, how does that sound to you? And you're able to get that feedback from, from that friend of, wow, that's, that's not okay. You start to see just how far off from healthy perhaps that relationship is. And that can be a super validating way to help you really start to see what's going on. And like you said, develop that, that confidence again. I can envision gaslighting, narcissistic behaviors, manipulation, control, and so forth with some people can cause us to isolate. I just don't like being where I am, but I don't know who my friend is, a person who would empathize with me. I'm not sure I have a person with whom I have a safe relationship that I can even express myself. So therefore I will isolate what I'm building up to is isolation from Marty's and my perspective is one of the worst things you can do. Don't mm -hmm. isolate yourself. Find someone who will empathize with you, be a safe space such that you can talk it out. That is my perspective. You're the professional. If I've said anything that's not correct, please do correct me. Mm -hmm. 
I do think it's a very important part. And I think that's what makes narcissistic abuse so difficult and challenging is that if you imagine this narcissist puts all of their attention and energy into what they look like, they can often be very well liked in their community, at work, family, friends. So narcissistic abuse survivors in particular often feel very isolated because if they go to a family or friend and say, hey, this is happening at home or this is happening with my partner, you're likely to get one of two reactions. One, the person really can't believe it. And they're like, I've never seen them do that. I can't believe they would treat you that way. I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. Or two, they say, why would you put up with that? Why haven't you said anything? So survivors often feel a lot of blame and shame. So that's a tricky part for narcissistic abuse survivors. And that's why therapy, coaching, even finding groups online where you can start to see other people who are going through similar situations can be a great place to start. How can our listeners establish a business with you, contact you, get more information, connect with you? So you can find all of my resources at chelseabrookcole.com. I recently wrote a book, If Only I'd Known, How to Outsmart Narcissists at Guilt-Free Boundaries and Create Unshakable Self-Worth. I also have a free bi-monthly newsletter. So if people are really resonating and they want a place to start, I suggest that's a great place to start. I talk all about understanding and healing from narcissistic abuse, toxic relationships. You can get that at chelseabrookcole.com slash newsletter. For the person who is geographically separated from you, can you help that person virtually or does the Mm -hmm. person need to be in your office? Nope. Actually, I'm telehealth only. So that is, is a helpful thing. I help people all over the world. So wherever you are, feel free to contact me. And your book is, uh, tell us the title again, and is it available on Amazon, anywhere books are sold? Yep. You could Google it and I'm sure you'll be able to find it wherever books are sold. It's called, If Only I'd Known, How to Outsmart Narcissists, Set Guilt-Free Boundaries, and Create Unshakable Self-Worth. If only I had known, my guess that's reflective of your past and how you have reflected on what you've learned. It's certainly for that. And it's a, it's a phrase I've heard so often from narcissistic abuse survivors in general of if only I'd known this information, if only I'd known what a narcissist was, how to set boundaries, that I should be listening to my intuition, then maybe I would be in a different place. So it really speaks to all of that. And I want to help people get information as soon as possible to be able to help them wherever they find themselves. And let me close out with this thought that for the person who wants to restart a relationship Is that person who is coming out of a narcissistic relationship somewhat susceptible to and almost very, very consciously know what a narcissist is to not become involved or ensnared in that kind of relationship again? Mm -hmm. It's definitely important to take that period to understand what you've been through, to understand the impact it had on you. Generally, the advice is take a year off if this has been a romantic relationship Give yourself time and space to understand what you've been through, to go through all the seasons, all the anniversaries, all the things to build back that sense of self. Chelsea, that's great advice. I know a lot of our listeners are experiencing what you're experiencing. It's just difficult to understand, although I I guess I can understand that some people just enjoy, there's something, some narcissistic people who Mm -hmm. just enjoy controlling and manipulating others. Um, very happy that Marty and I, in just a few <laughs> weeks, will have uh, 55 years of marriage. It's a great, great relationship. Chelsea, thank you for your work. Thank you for passing forward your life experience and helping others to overcome and avoid these narcissistic type relationships that we have been in contact with. And we know that a lot of our listeners are being dominated by, they are being gaslighted by others Mm -hmm. who just have that sadistic nature to them. I call it that wanting Mm -hmm. to control others, just not a good life, but there is a much better life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate y'all's work and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Chelsea. We look forward to continuing the life journey and the dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you in any form of a toxic relationship? Narcissists frequently justify their disposition, their manner of being by gaining acceptance from others. They project themselves in a very charming, acceptable, maybe humorous way with others such that when a person who is the target of a narcissist 
when describing that person's behavior to another would say, oh, I have never experienced that person the way you're describing him or her. Are you in a toxic relationship? A person who causes you to feel less than what you are, maybe causes you to feel unworthy, that's a part of gaslighting. And it's a part of making you feel you are not worthy of being the person God created you to be. Chelsea is very eloquent in talking about boundaries. We need to have boundaries beyond which we say, you're not going to take me there such as you're not going to make me feel unworthy you're not going to make me doubt whether i told you something but rather i'm going to stand up to what i know to be truth I, what i know to be fact it is a matter of having the confidence to express yourself in a very confident way not to demean someone but to be very confident, I am not the person you are trying to negatively describe. If you are feeling any type of less self-worth than what God created you to be, if you feel any amount of blame, shame, such that possibly you would consider isolating, I wanna encourage you to take an introspective look, please, Seek help of a coach, a therapist, someone who can help you realize you are in a toxic relationship. You are with someone who's trying to make you feel less than who you are, what you can be. When you have the confidence to know you can confront that person, you have the confidence, you can deal with the situation you are in, you're able to verbalize those boundaries, not in a demeaning, caustic way, but rather, no, you're not going to make me feel this way about myself. We're going to deal with this situation. Marty and I have a red flag questionnaire in our relationship course that can help you identify whether you are possibly in a caustic, toxic relationship. Some people want to make you feel that what you're sensing is just normal. You just deal with it and continue on. But when you stop to take an introspective look, you can learn if you are in a toxic relationship. You can seek the help of a coach, therapist, and deal with the situation you are in. Marty and I are certified coaches through the John Maxwell Leadership Certified Team. We want to help you be the very best person God created you to be to live your potential. Let's schedule a 30-minute complimentary coaching session where we can demonstrate to you how we can help you be the very best person to have the performing potential that God designed you to have. Contact us at ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. Let's work together to help you be the very best God created you to be. We hope you'll want to share this podcast with your podcast friends, your LinkedIn connections, your Facebook friends, your Twitter and Instagram communities. The more we share with people, the greater the opportunity we will have to interact with, help people get beyond toxic relationships, to help people live a wholesome, fulfilled life. There are some who unfortunately get pleasure out of demeaning others to control others and make them feel a lesser person than who they are. The more we work together, the greater the opportunity we will have to advance others to help them be the person God created them to be to live a total fulfilled life. We look forward to the opportunity to speak with your group, to share our life experiences, to help advance people within your group. You can contact us at eSpeakers, plural, dot com 
search for Ron Cooper, F4 pilot. I look forward to speaking with your group, interacting with you, and helping you get beyond whatever you may be dealing with to help you be the very best person God created you to be. We look forward to working with you to advance people to their maximum performance potential.